Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? You know, at Encourager, we're, uh, we're, not, it's not, we're, we're not stuffy, you know, stilted. We're, we're, we don't worry about so much what the, what the preacher's wearing, you know. And I wasn't going to wear slacks. I was going to wear jeans today, yeah. And Tammy said, well, your mom's going to be here. <laughs> so my parents are over here, so thankful for them in the audience. That's funny. Okay. Uh, okay, let's, let's, let's open up with a word of prayer. So, Father God, I say you are a generous God. You, are, you love to give. You're a cheerful giver, Father, and we want to be like you. So, God, help us this morning to hear what you want to say. God, help me as I talk, and I just pray your blessing on every person here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, so this morning... Uh, If you're taking notes, the official title of this sermon is The Glory is in the Giving. The Glory is in the Giving. So I'm going to talk to you about giving. Now, I was was around, I was young, but I was around when, uh, in an era when a number of famous televangelists, you know, TV preachers, whatnot, they were exposed, you know, as having sin in their lives. And, you know, they, they, they had a well, they might have said on the news, a fall from grace. It turns out that they were wasting money. They were asking people to send in donations, but they were doing not so great things with it. And I remember that, and, and it kind of gave the gospel, or it kind of gave preachers a bad name. So, you know, you remember that, Bob. So, uh, you know, a preacher gets up and talks about money. Well, that's because that preacher, you know, just wants more money, and it all goes to his, whatever. I hope that that will not keep you or hinder you from hearing what I have to say today. Because I believe giving is the will of God for your life, and it has a life-changing power. So I'm going to talk about that. So I'm going to open up with a scripture that uh, we'll come back to later, but just to get you thinking about it. This is from the book of Haggai, one of the minor prophets there towards the end of the Old Testament in your Bible. And Haggai chapter 2, starting at verse 6, says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations. And what is desired of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace. Okay, so... Put that on the shelf for a little while. We'll come back to it. First question I have, if we're going to talk about giving, why do we give? Why do we give? I don't know if you've ever asked this, yourself this question. If you've been, uh, if you were a good, obedient little child in Sunday school, so the Bible says God wants us to give, be givers. And you're like, well, if God says it, that's good enough for me. And that is good, okay? But I do want to talk about it more. Why, why do we give? Now, one easy assumption you could make is, well, God must be low on cash and must need money. Well, I have news for you today. God doesn't need our money. In Psalm 50, 12, it says, God says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. I have three kids, and when they are hungry, they tell me. But if God were hungry, if God needed a loan... God would not come ask us to borrow money, okay? Listen, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and he owns all. Look, the earth is his and everything that's in it. He owns all the, ban- all the money and all the banks. He owns you and me, everything, the whole universe. Listen, God in his omnipotence could snap his fingers and bring abundance to every poor person on the planet. Just piles of money, bing, you know, on their, on their dining room table if, if he wanted to. But amazingly, even though he could, he's chosen not to do that. So the question is why? Well, I have some, I have some ideas. For one, we are children of our Father, and God wants us to be imitators of him. And God is a giver, and he wants us to learn to be like him and to give. Okay? There are problems on earth. There are problems of need, problems of poverty, problems somebody has a vision, but they don't have the means to accomplish it. Guess what? God has called us, has called you to be part of the solution. And you can be a financial backer to those solutions. Okay? There are more ways to give than money, but today we're focusing on on that kind of giving. 
Okay? Think of this. You ever been at a restaurant and, and you know, you order some new dessert that you've never tried before. Maybe it's uh, that bread pudding at Papa Do's that they have that's good. Maybe it's, you know, some kind of brownie or cheesecake. Or maybe it's creme brulee. Anybody, anybody like creme brulee? What if you've never tried it and you order it and it gets to the table and you take a bite. And you're there with your friends whom you love. And you're like, this is amazing. What is your response? You've got to try this. Here, everybody, get a spoon and take a bite of this and see how good it is. What if God loves to give so much that he's like, my kids have absolutely got to try this. Because, because it is so good, it says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Listen, God, God can provide miraculously, and he does. You talk to missionaries, talk to believers Talk to old people who have been around a long time, and they can tell you stories where God multiplies food and does the miraculous, okay? But, but listen, it may sound funny to say it, that's not his only business model. I believe that God will provide our needs, and you know what? I intend to get up and go to work on Monday morning. Actually, I'm on vacation this week, but you get the picture, okay? I still go to work, and they still give me a paycheck. Uh, God, God set up laws like sowing and reaping, investing and interest, okay? He, set, he, he, he knows about labor and reward. And he intends us, I believe he intends us, his people, to excel in these areas so that we understand you work hard, you get a reward. You sow a seed, you get a return. But he reserves the right to step in from time to time and do something amazing. He gives us something you didn't work for. He, 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 it's like he, he, he supersedes his own laws, and, and he just he provides miraculously. You know, one time my grandma was praying. She didn't have food to eat, and she was outside. I think she was hanging up clothes, and she, she like, bowed her head to pray. You know, I don't know what she prayed. God, I don't have anything for dinner. She opened her eyes, and there was a dog with a packet of butcher paper in its mouth. She took the butcher paper, and it wasn't pierced by the dog's teeth. She opened it up, and it was steak. It was steak, and she took it. Is that true? Is that true? God can provide in miraculous ways, but, but he also intends, generally, his will probably, I can predict for just about everybody in this room, is that you get a job, and that you work, and or earn money, and that you give some of it away. Okay? So, anyway, our infinite God with infinite wealth trusts us with finite resources or constrains us to finite resources. And as we use those and give those and manage those with integrity, it both shows our character and it grows our character. We learn as we work with money, giving, receiving, diligence, tithing, whatever else, honesty. We learn. Thank you, Lord, for the rain. We learn, you know, about handling wealth. And it also, guys, it is it is a revealer of what is in your heart. I'm not going to go into it, but you know there's the parables of the minas and the talents. And those who were faithful with the little were trusted with the much. Okay, so in this life, with this money that I can't hang on to, I want to be faithful so that when I go on, that I, I was found faithful and I can be trusted with true wealth. So why do we give? Because God wants us to be like him. Because it shows what's inside our hearts. That's, that's what I think. Now, I want to talk to you about the power of anointed giving. Anointed giving. You know, the word, uh, the word in Greek, the New Testament was written in Greek. The word in Greek for grace or favor, that's two translations of the same word, is charis. Okay, charis or charis or something like that. Okay, so... Another translation, another potential translation besides grace and favor is generosity, generosity. So plug that in to one of your favorite scriptures that has to do with grace. How about this one? How about Ephesians 2.8? For by generosity are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. You are saved because we have a giving, generous Father. So, listen, you know, we, we believe here in the Holy Spirit and the gift of spirit, that makes us, by definition, charismatics or Pentecostal or full gospel or whatever you want to call it. And so sometimes we charismatics, uh, 
we, we, we talk about grace and favor, experiencing the grace and favor of the Lord. And sometimes what this looks like is, I got a front row parking space at Walmart today. It's favor of the Lord. Oh, I was at Denny's today, and the waitress lost my ticket, and they didn't charge me anything. Favor of the Lord. Free food right there. Look, I, I've been in... I've been in tight spots where I appreciated free food, okay? And I, I don't want to knock that. But, but you don't have to wait for favor and grace to happen to you. You can, be, you can be an outlet of favor and grace. You can go to a restaurant, maybe this afternoon or tonight, and you can buy somebody else's meal. And that's, that's the favor and the grace of God, and it's poured out through you because you have that power because you have the power to give, okay? You know, I was at Bethel a few weeks ago, and... Somebody was up there, and it wasn't one of the famous pastors. It wasn't Bill Johnson or Chris Valentin or whoever. Just some guy who works there, I don't know. And he got up, and he said, when you give, you invite people into an encounter with God. Because this is what happens when they give, what's their natural response? If you give to somebody in need, they're going to say, thank God. And according to Psalms 100, verse 4, you enter his gates with thanksgiving. What if there's an unbeliever and you give and they say, thank you, Jesus. And it opens their eyes and it opens their heart to the gospel. It's part of the power of giving. Look, I was in, a number of years ago, I went, I attended a conference with Randy Clark when it was in Querétaro, Querétaro say, somebody say it, Querétaro, Mexico. And uh, Pastor Fernando was there, Pastor Bob Phillips was there, some other people uh, Gary Nething was there. I don't know if, do you remember that conference we went to? And there was another guy. Look, there weren't a lot of Americans on the trip. In fact, if you were American at that conference there in the heart of Mexico, you got your name on the bulletin. <laughs> so Gary and I had our names on the bulletin. It was a hoot because we were up there with Randy Clark and we weren't speaking. So, uh, anyway, there was another American on the trip, a guy I didn't really get to know him. And I, to be honest, I didn't really like the guy a whole lot. But as we spent time together, we were driving along one day in a van, and he, like, sees some, I don't, I don't think it was someone begging. I think it was just a random person on the street. And, you know, in, in America, there's so much abundance, and, and in Mexico, often you see so much poverty. The guy took, like, $20, this fellow American, he took, like, $20, and he, like, rolls down the window, and he hands it to this random stranger on the street. And he's like, yeah, to, to him, it's going to be worth so much more than it is to me. It's like, oh, okay, okay, that's whatever, you know, I wouldn't have done that necessarily. But then later, we were, at, we were in one of the meetings of the conference, and something amazing happened. They took up an offering, okay, that's not the amazing part. And uh, they took up an offering, and this guy's sitting there, and the lady comes by, the lady passing the offering basket, one of the people, she's passing the offering basket, and she holds a basket, and this guy puts his money in the offering basket, and the power of God hits that woman, and she goes on the ground. She gets slain in the spirit. And it's not that, it's not that slain in the spirit is the, is the object or the goal. The goal is, is your giving backed by the power of the Holy Spirit? What if God tells you to give, and when you give, an additional miracle that money could never have accomplished happens with it? Okay? Because when you obey God or when you're moved in love, you're acting in love, that giving can be powerful. In Isaiah 58, the Lord is speaking about his chosen fast. And I'll read this. He says, Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free, and that you break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring the poor that are cast out to your house. When you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you not hide yourself from your own flesh. It brings out the best. Whoever's got the most heart. And the worst. Brings out the best. Thank you, Lord. What was that? Wow. That's amazing. Okay. He says, then, like, if you do that, then shall your light break forth as the morning, and your health shall spring forth speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, here I am. 
And he goes on, he says, if you offer yourself to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall your light rise in darkness. It says the Lord will make you fat. The Lord will make you a, like a spring of water that does not run dry. Guys, giving, generosity is one of the keys to experiencing the blessing of the Lord. Okay? It's one of the keys. You may have heard many sermons or a number of sermons on the power of confession, the power of the prophetic declaration, the power even of positive thinking and positive speech. There's even a saying, there's a miracle in your mouth. I think that's, that's a good sermon. That's a good sermon title right there. There's a miracle in your mouth. I'm not preaching that sermon today. What I want to tell you today is that there's a weapon in your wallet. And the devil is terrified that you ever figure out how to use this thing. The devil wants you to have a, a carry and conceal license and keep it concealed. But the Lord, listen, listen to this. The Lord has, has, I believe, has given you an arm, and he wants you to learn to use it. It's called giving. That's why I got my Nerf gun up here, okay? Okay, listen. When Jamie Galloway was here a couple weeks ago, in, at the end of first service, you can hear it on the podcast, he gave a, a prophetic word. And one thing he said was, abundance will break the back of poverty. When you give... When you give, when you take a shot, you give a gift to someone or, you know, a ministry or whatever, it, it, you are fighting for the kingdom of light, and you're fighting against the kingdom of darkness, okay? You know what, one thing, Anne-Marie, my daughter, after, she's 12, after the first service, she came up to me, she's like, here's what you need to change about your sermon. <laughs> and she said, I need to explain more how giving is like a gun, it's like a weapon, I'm going to get into it, but here's one thing. Giving, when you give, it punches fear in the face. Because sometimes you've got to say no to fear in order to give the gift. But when that person is there and they're, they're on the verge of doubting God and they're crying out for provision, God, we don't have groceries, God, I don't have money to go on this mission trip, whatever it is, and you step in as the hand of God and he gives through you, bam, their faith is built. And they stop believing the lie that they have to do it all with their own hands. Once Tammy and I were able to give a gift to, a, to somebody, and, and she, what did she say? She was like, you know, I had just, what did she say? I just decided to start trusting the Lord. Single mom. Man, punch fear in the face. Anyway, so, but say it is like a gun. Couple people who use guns. Who are people who use guns? I have two main examples. One is... You use <laughs> hunters, and one is soldiers. Now, if you were a soldier, if you're a soldier, and your commanding officer called you up, said, you know, Private Colin, come up here. Don't come up, I'm just saying. And he, said, he says, well, I want you to go fight the enemy. You're like, yes, sir. And he goes, here's your bullet. If I'm going to fight the enemy, I want more than one bullet. And, or or what, if you're, what if you're a police officer? You know who the, the police officer who carries one bullet? Who is it? Barney Five. That's right. You kids go on YouTube and YouTube, look up Barney Five, the, the deputy with one bullet. What if you're a hunter? When you're going to go out to bag a, a trophy buck or whatever, one bullet, well, in the end, maybe that's all you shoot, and if you're lucky, but you're going to take out, you're going to bring a bunch of bullets out there in the field with you, you want to be prepared. My point is this, you may have given in the past, you may have tried out this giving thing, and you, so you took a shot, okay, you took a shot, sorry, <laughs> point <it> this way, <laughs> you took a shot, it's nerf, it's foam, my apologies to the person I gave a heart attack to. Lord Jesus, help me. Uh, you took a shot, and maybe it missed. You're like, well, the missionary said that he was, that he was going to win all of South America next week, and so I gave, and he didn't. Oh, I gave to that person, to those poor people, and they spent it on a new DVD player. Or, you know, they said I'd get ten times back. God would give me ten times back, and I gave ten dollars. Anyway, listen. What if you gave, what if you took a shot and you missed? What do you need to do again? Take another shot. That's right. And the more you take shots, the better your aim will get. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. The better you'll get. And you know what? You, God may have, start having you go from 22 ammo up to 30, 30-06 30 ammo. Or maybe eventually up to elephant gun ammo. And imagine, imagine you give somebody... It's one thing to give your waiter a great tip, give them an extra 20 bucks or 50 bucks or whatever and tell them Jesus loves them. But what if God wants you to give somebody a car? What if God wants you to give somebody a house? I've never done that, okay? I've never given. But what if there's an elephant-sized victory, an elephant-sized whatever problem out there, and the solution is, is, is to give? Just saying, God help us. You know what? You know what? Sometimes giving has a kick, and it hurts. But God wants us to know that giving is a kick. Giving is, giving is fun. Giving is joy. God said he loves a cheerful giver. And I want to, oh, man, I want to get there. I want to get there. All right. Uh, I went to the eye doctor recently, and he told me that my vision wasn't quite 20-20 anymore. It was, you know, kind of nearsighted as I'm in my 40s. And uh, so, you know, I got I, a prescription waiting somewhere on the other side of town. But I want to talk to you about bad eyes, bad eyes, having a bad eye. Now, in, in the Old Testament, the Old Testament was, and was written mainly in Hebrew and the New Testament in Greek. Uh, sometimes they use things called idioms or idiomatic expressions. We have these in English. I'll talk about them. And the, the problem is when we as English speakers, we don't necessarily understand what the Bible is saying when it says certain stuff. So here's an example of an idiomatic expression. It's something that doesn't mean what it sounds like literally. So if I say, oh, we were planning a surprise party, but then somebody let the cat out of the bag. Was there a cat? Was there a bag? No, it was a secret, okay? How about this? How about if you got two guys that used to work together, and the one guy is like, hey, maybe I can get my old job back, you know, with our boss. And the guy says, man, when you stabbed him in the back, you really burned your bridges, Somebody sitting next nearby that didn't speak English as a native language, they'd be like, he stabbed somebody with a knife and he set a bridge on fire? Like, what? Here's, here's the, the funny one. Uh, a, a college student comes from another country and gets a job at McDonald's while he's studying. First day on the job, he's behind the counter, ready, and he, uh, 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 an American man comes in and the man says, yeah, give me a Big Mac and step on it. <laughs> you understand, step on it means step on the gas pedal, go quickly, do this fast. But if you don't speak that language fluently, you're like, you want me to give you a Big Mac and you want me to step on it. In, in the Old Testament, the Lord speaks to the people of Israel, and he says, basically, if you see someone in need in the land, and you do not, he says, don't, don't, basically, he says, don't have a bad eye and fail to give to them. Don't have a bad eye and fail to give to them. He says, you're going to, you need to give to them and give them everything they need, basically. So you've got this idiom, bad eye, bad eye, and it, it appears elsewhere in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, uh, Jesus, he talks about he talks about the man who hired the workers throughout the day. And the guy who got hired early in the morning and worked all day and got paid the same as the guy who worked just in a few hours, you know, that guy's mad. And the master replies, he says, is it not lawful for me to do what I want with what is mine? Or is your eye bad because I am good? He says, is your eye bad because I'm good? So why am, I bringing, why am I talking about this? Because finally in Matthew Six, Jesus says three things, and all three of them are about money, but we don't realize necessarily the middle one's about money. The first one, he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up treasure in heaven. Okay? In the third, you know, a few verses down, he said, in verse 24, he says, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. We know that's about money. But in between those two, he says, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is whole, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then that light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? I believe that Jesus is saying, if you do not have eyes to see the needs around you, the needs of your brothers and sisters, and you, you refuse to give, and you refuse to be generous, it's like you're blind. 
It's like you're blind. And that brings darkness. That keeps light from entering your soul. That, brings, that keeps the light of the Lord from entering your life. And I don't want to be, I don't want to be like that. Now, speaking of the, the eye doctor, the eye doctor, he did a, like a retinal, ex, retinal exam. And he's like, basically, he says, you don't have diabetes. Like, how do you look at somebody, somebody's eyes and know if they have diabetes? Well, evidently, if you had diabetes, you would have damage in those blood vessels. I've heard that, I read that you can, you can diagnose high blood pressure based on an eye exam. Jesus, elsewhere in the New Testament, he says that a bad eye, a bad eye comes from a bad heart. A bad eye comes from a bad heart. He said the food you eat doesn't make you unclean. The stuff that comes out of your heart makes you unclean. And that was one of them. So anyway, Lord, you know, I pray, God, give, me, give us eyes to see and hearts, you know, to give. Eyes to see and hearts to give. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is the third and final main point I want to make. I want to talk about the glory of the Lord filling the temple. Okay. So quick history lesson. This is a long, involved story, and I'm going to try to make it really short. In 1500 B.C., 1500 years before Jesus was born, God speaks to Moses and says, build a tabernacle. It's a tent. It's a dwelling place for the Spirit of the Lord. It's a place of worship. And so Moses builds a tabernacle. He has these guys build the tabernacle. It's mobile, okay? And, and it's the place of worship for the Israelites. And when they're done, when they complete it, the cloud descends and God fills the tabernacle with glory to the point that, like, the priests can't even go in and do their thing. That went on for about 500 years, and David was like, King David was like, I want to build a, 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 a temple, not just a tent, but a house, a building. And God's like, well, that's nice, but actually you can't do it. Your son's going to do it. So Solomon builds this temple, and he builds a magnificent structure, and the temple, you know, replaces the tabernacle. And when they, when they are all finished with the temple, and, you know, they like dedicate it or whatever, they, they do their thing. And it's like they're getting ready to use it, and the glory of the Lord comes, and it fills the temple. And the priests can't, stand, can't do their thing because of the glory of the Lord that filled the temple. By the way, Solomon was not known for understatement. I can only imagine it was a magnificent piece of architecture, okay, with gold and whatever else. Sadly, in a very, a very dark portion of, of is, Israeli history, Israelite history, 400 years later, the Babylonians come in. Uh, you know, Israel has rebelled against God repeatedly, and finally judgment falls. And the Babylonians come, and they deport, you know, a bunch of the Jews, and, and they destroy the temple. The temple, the center of their worship is destroyed. Guys, that would, that would rock your faith if that happened, okay? If the center of your faith, this, this the Mount Zion, if it were destroyed like that. And... Uh, Anyway, be, thus began the Babylonian exile, and, and it, was, it was really bad, but some good stuff happened in the midst of that period. But about 50 years later, they began rebuilding the temple. Now, this is the era of Haggai and Zechariah and Nehemiah and Ezra and these, you know, books of the Bible we might not be so familiar with. And, and, and they're rebuilding the temple, and it's a long process. But during that time, Haggai prophesies to encourage them, Okay. And he says, and I read it or I'll read it again. It says, for thus says the Lord of hosts, uh, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations and what is desired of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. So it's like you're building a temple. It got torn down. You're rebuilding it. It's called the second temple, by the way. It's known as the second temple. The second temple is being rebuilt or being built, whatever, to replace the first one that got destroyed. And God's like, it really doesn't look very impressive, but I'm telling you, it's going to be glorious. It's going to be even more glorious than the previous. One, one, def, one interpretation of that word is that it's going to have such rich jewels and architecture and building materials that it's going to be glorious in the sense of like golden jewels. You get that? Glorious architecture. 
But the other, the other interpretation, of course, is that the glory of God is going to come and fill the temple. The cloud will fill the temple in a supernatural way like it, like it did before. Okay. Time went on, and as far as I can tell in the Old Testament, that never happened. The glory never filled the temple like it did for Solomon and like it did for Moses. 500 years pass, and a king arises called Herod, Herod the Great. He self-identifies as a Jew, but his lifestyle does not really convey that. But anyway, King Herod, what does he do? He spends a bunch of money, and he renovates that temple, and he makes it really amazing. He makes the temple amazing. It's so amazing that in in the New Testament, at one point, Jesus is walking at the temple with his disciples. And the disciple says, Lord, look at these stones. Look at these buildings. Like, isn't it amazing? And and so it's pretty amazing. But Jesus says, he, he foretells the destruction of the temple. He says, not one stone will be left on another. That prophecy, that prediction was fulfilled in A.D. 70. You can, okay, so this is, ni- this is 2019, so back in the year 70, the Romans came in and destroyed Herod's temple, the second temple. So yet again, the Jews' place of worship is destroyed. What happened? What happened? Did, did God fill the temple with glory? Was that it? Was, it? was Herod's funding, was that it? Okay, well, let's back up. Let's back up, okay? Back up to around the year 33, Jesus has just been crucified. He rose again. He was on the earth, you know, for 40 days, whatever, and, and then 10 days. And then he, he, uh, he ascends to heaven, and the disciples are hanging out for 10 days. And at one point, they're in the upper room, and they're, I don't know, I guess they're trying to figure out what to do going forward. They vote on a new disciple. And then what happens? The day of Pentecost arrives, okay? <laughs> Thank you. The day of Pentecost arrives. What is the day of Pentecost? It's one of three big Jewish feasts where the law says you have to go to Jerusalem. You can't celebrate this feast at your house. You have to make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. To me, it's like there's Thanksgiving, Christmas, and 4th of July. This, maybe this was like the 4th of July. It's one of the big holidays. And you got to go to Jerusalem. So what it is, it's the Feast of Weeks. That means seven sevens. You count off a week of sevens, like a month of Sundays. Okay, and you count off 49 days, and then you have this, this, fest, this festival, and it's a wheat harvest festival. It celebrates the bringing in of the wheat harvest, but also happens to coincide with the giving of the law. Because after the first Passover, when they came out of Egypt, 50 days later, God gave the law. And the law was highly esteemed by the Jews, okay? So they got a number of reasons to celebrate. The harvest, the law, you know, big deal. There are people from all over, like, the Roman world who have traveled to Jerusalem who were, like, converts to Judaism or maybe they're native-born Jews, but they've traveled from all over the world, and they're in Jerusalem at the temple to celebrate the feast of Pentecost. Okay, Pentecost means 50th, so that's why we said it, but the Feast of Weeks according to the law. Now, the, the, the disciples who were in the upper room and whatnot, you know, Jesus gone, what are we going to do going forward? They're good Jews. They're still Jewish, okay? They haven't, there are no Gentile Christians. They believe in Jesus, but they're still Jewish. So what do good Jews do at the Feast of Weeks? They go to the temple. They go to the temple, okay? So then what happens, what happens when they're in the temple? The, God breathes. God breathes, tongues of fire, there's, there's a sound like a, a wind or something. God breathes, the fire comes, they start speaking in tongues, and all the other Jews, all these other people that are there at the festival, they're like, what is going on? I'm from France, and I can understand what they're saying, and this guy's from Japan. I'm making these, you know, it wasn't literally that, but you get the idea. I'm from Indonesia, and I'm from Africa, and I can understand what all these guys are saying. And Peter gets up, and he says, well, they're not drunk. He says, this is the Holy Spirit, and and Jesus died for you. He tells him the gospel. How many people get saved? 3,000 people from all over the the Roman world. 3,000 people come into the kingdom. So this is what's amazing is the parallels in this, okay? In the Old Testament, the temple was made of stone. In the New Testament, the temple is made of living stones, and it's you, and it's me, and it's every believer, We are the temple. We are the dwelling place of the Spirit of God. He wants to abide in us. We are a living temple, okay? On the day of Pentecost, the church was born. The church was born. 
Do you know that at the festival of harvest, a harvest of souls was brought in? Do you know, instead of the giving of the law, it was the giving of the Holy Spirit. And I believe that we can argue that the temple was filled with glory on that day. The temple, the living stones temple, was hanging out inside the temple in Jerusalem. And the Holy Spirit came and filled the temple. And do you know what? The desired things of all nations came in. But it wasn't gold. It wasn't jewels. It was people. It was people from, I don't know, Africa or Europe and Asia or wherever else those people were from. Listen, who, how many nations are represented in this room? You are jewels. You are desired by the Lord from all nations. And you have come into this temple. And the Lord wants to fill it with glory. Now I want to point out something else. In the Old Testament, when he built the tabernacle, the, when it was done, the glory came and filled it. When they, when they built the temple, when it was done, the glory came and he filled, you know, he filled it. At the day of Pentecost, the, the, the church was born. It was not completed. It was not finished. God didn't wait for the temple, this temple of living stones to be completed before he filled it with glory. He filled it from the beginning. He filled it from the beginning. And you know what? I believe that as time passes and the church grows and the gospel is preached to all nations and more and more people come in, that temple is growing. You know what I think? I think that glory is meant to increase also. He says, it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. What does this have to do with giving? And I'm, I'm pretty much closing. So what does it have to do with giving? When they built the tabernacle, they took up an offering. The people gave. When they built the temple, they took up an offering. People gave. When they were refin- re- refurbishing the temple, people gave. Okay? There is a part that we have to play. It's not all on, all on our shoulders, but there's a part that we have to play in building and maintaining the temple. And it has to do with us giving. Okay? I'm not talking about a building. I'm not about to take up an offering for a building fund. Not that we, you know, couldn't use some renovations. But still, it's about you. It's about your brothers and sisters. It's about me and you, the living temple. Our call is to take care of the temple and to build it. What does this look like? How do we do it? Well, you know, if you buy a house, it costs money. And and then when I was first got married and bought a house, I didn't realize this. It costs money to maintain a house. Like, we're looking at remodeling a bathroom, ripping up some carpet, redoing the roof, and it just costs money to maintain the house. But what does it look like when you and I maintain the house and we build the house? Well, one thing it looks like is when we give to people in need. Lillian, I'm going to use you. Imagine, Lillian's in need. Lillian, I don't know, fell upon hard times. And God speaks to me and some of y'all, and we give to her. We give to her, we buy her groceries, we buy her, you know, help her buy gasoline, whatever it is. We give, we take, that. you know what you're doing? We take care of the temple, okay? What about, what about when a missionary comes through and he says, yeah, God has called us to go to, to China or to, to South America or wherever, you know, but we need your help to reach these souls. We give and we're building the temple. We enable them to do, to do what they do. What if the Lord speaks to you to give money to a total stranger, somebody who doesn't know the Lord? What if it changes their life? What if it makes them open to the gospel? What if there's another soul in heaven in eternity because you gave 50 bucks to your waiter or whatever? You're You're building the temple. Last one. Last and not least, when you guys, when we just tithe faithfully, man, not only do we support the, the people, the staff, the pastors who work here and allow them to, to, to dedicate their lives to our spiritual well-being, but we all, we're also giving to all kind of ministries, man, that touch around the world. So uh, last scripture, Acts 2, 42 through 45. So Acts, Acts 2 is the Pentecostal's favorite chapter in the Bible. The glory, you know, the spirit comes. What's at the end of that chapter? 
And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods, and shared them with all men, as every man had need. And what does it say? And daily their numbers were being added to. Guys, when the, when the glory came, the Spirit came, they took care of the house. They took care of each other. And that temple was built daily, another stone, another stone. They were building the temple. At Encourager, we just went through Financial Peace University on Wednesday night, not long ago. Uh, then the staff was doing Financial Peace. What is, the, what is the Lord doing? Is he calling us to, to a place where we know better how to handle money, how to get out of debt, so that we can be more generous? Because you can't give away a million dollars if you don't have a million dollars. So, you know, like, like I, I know that, I know that th this is a giving church. I'm not saying you guys don't give, but what if the Lord is calling us to the next level? Calling us from the squirrel hunting to the deer hunting to the elephant hunting. You know, what if... What if, I mean, I, I know it is. I know he wants to change the world through your generosity. Amen. Amen. Listen, uh, God doesn't need our money, but he's given us this weapon that we can use. And he wants to give us good eyes to see the needs around us. And I believe that as we take care of the temple and we build the temple, the glory is going to fill the temple. Hallelujah. Would you stand up, please? Thank you, thank you. And could I have uh, the musicians and the, uh, the altar team, if you would come up. Listen, let me, let me say this. When the world needed saving, when the world was lost in sin, God gave. God gave. That was his solution to the problem. God gave, and he didn't give money. He gave his son. And if you're here today, nothing else really matters. Nothing I've said really matters until you receive this gift. Until you receive the gift of Jesus, all the other money stuff doesn't even matter. So if you're here today and you need to meet the Lord, you want to meet the Lord, he asks you to give him everything, but you know what? He doesn't hold back. He'll take care of you. He do, he'll take care of you. If you have anything you want to pray about, if you have a financial need, if you have uh, anything, relationships, fear, oppression, anything, man, come up and pray with some of these prayer, work, prayer warriors. I want to thank you for listening to me today. Thank Pastor Fernando for having me. I'm going to, I'm going to close in prayer. You know, I just believe that the Lord is going to use this church and use that weapon of giving, and it's going to make an impact. It's going to make an impact in our city, in our nation, in our world, in Jesus' name. So, Father, you are generous. Make us like you. Give us your eyes to see and your heart to give. And let your glory fill your temple. In Jesus' name, amen.